All right, so we are back. Welcome to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin. This is lecture six, namespaces in XML11, SVG11, and XSLFO 1.0. We ended last week's lecture with a bit of a cliffhanger, if you recall. There's one slide on which we're linked to a couple of different Zalin related pages, and these were in specific reference to uh, Zalin's extension functions. And at least one of you explored these on your own, as we saw on a recent listserv message, um, perhaps from him or from anyone else familiar. What are these Zalin extension functions, or really XSLT extension functions? <laughs> functions that they missed or should have. Okay, fair enough. So XSLT via a namespace mechanism essentially, which we'll touch upon tonight, allows you to extend the built-in capabilities of XSLT. You get with a lot of um, XSLT processors some additional functionality. Think blink tag, but actually useful when it comes to proprietary support. So in the gentleman who posted to the listserv this past week uh, made reference to a node set function, which quite simply was a function that Zalin supports that allows you to convert what was called an RTF or result tree fragment, which was this weird sort of data type, into an actual node set, which is of much greater interest. Also available via Zalin's extension functions are things like trigonometric functions, like sine and cosine, which though you might question the need for, now that we'll begin to dive tonight into SVG, in the world of graphics, especially when you're talking about vector graphics, which are very much formulaic and mathematical in their construction and their, in their generation of lines and shapes, well, having access to math libraries like basic trig functions is actually a very useful thing indeed. Moreover, what these, these extension functions allow you to do in effect is also to implement your own, say, Java code and to invoke it via an XSLT style sheet. For now, you've probably been having uh, your hands full enough with XSLT and XPath over the past couple of weeks, so rather than spend too much time on yet crazier things you can do with XSLT, what I'll do is at least just give you one demonstration or one example here that's taken right from Zalin's own documentation. Um, this, even on a on a computer screen is rather difficult to read. So what I've done is pasted that content into stylus here just so that we can see it in larger text form. This is an example taken from Zalin's documentation. And notice that, like we've seen before, there's this attribute up here, the XMLNS for XML namespace, colon Zalin. And we've seen this Zalin prefix before. In fact, where have you seen it in our own style sheets that we've distributed to you? It's always been at the top in a couple of the style sheets. We used it for a very simple reason. Yeah, for indentation. We were essentially parameterizing Zalin to tell it that when you use the output method with indentation on for XML format, we specified via this XSL, uh, via this um, Zalin specific attribute exactly what we mean by to indent. And as you, if you look at the top of at least, I think, my blockbuster and xtube.xsl, you'll see that we arbitrarily said four spaces is an indentation. Well, up here we have, again, this definition of a Zalin prefix, which we'll leave it at that for now, as I've highlighted. Here you have a very simple template that defines, first, that outputs, first of all, a raw element called, just to give you a chance to play along at home here, First thing this template does when applied to the root of some XML input document is to do what? I'd say you're jumping ahead, the very first thing. Uh, okay, well the template is defined in line, what is it, six there. The first thing this template does is to Okay, matches on the root. So the second thing this template does? Uh, comments. Yeah, there we go. So it, begins, it generates this out element, right? There's no uh, XSL prefix there. So this isn't some special built-in function or XSLT element. So it just outputs a literal, a raw out element. This would be equivalent to doing XSL colon element name equals quote unquote out, but it's just not necessary because recall that an XSLT processor, if it doesn't understand or recognize some element, it's typically just going to output it 
as raw. I see some squinting. Is this sufficiently legible? Yes, no? No, okay, what would help? Bigger font, lower light? Lower light, let's try that. And Chris, just tell me if I get it too dim in here. Yeah, okay. A little better? Cutting down the brightness? Oh, it's an orange -ish thing. Uh, well, how about, how about that? No? All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about, let's spend no more than 10 more seconds on this. X, uh, what are we in? XML editor. XML setting. No. Uh, editor format. All right. So we can make it bigger if you think that helps. Otherwise, we'd have to manually override all of these. Make it bolder. Oh, bolder. That's clever. Let's see. Bolder. Uh, not with a font that's going to look as useful. So let's leave that alone. Well, let's just try bigger and see if that gets us by for now. Okay. Better? No. <laughs> all right. Tough crowd. All right. All right, 18. Well, let's fix one of the colors, which looks like, oh, man, it's the element, uh, generic XML tag. That looks like it. So let's change that to, how about, um, black. Yeah? Oh, tough crowd. All right. <laughs> Moving on. At least it's red. It doesn't have to be pretty tonight. It's just legible. All right. So the first thing it does on line 7, and I know the line numbers are way too small for anyone to read, but on line 7, we output a raw start tag for an out element. On line 8, we begin to declare a variable called, in this case, RTF, which conveys the notion that what you're about to create is actually a variable of type, result tree fragment. The following tags that you see, doc elem and elem1, elem1a and b, all the way down to line 17, ultimately are stored in this variable called RTF, and it's a result tree fragment y. And what is that? It's pretty much just a string of XML. It might look like it has hierarchy. It lo might look like it's actually one root element called doc elem, beneath which is some number of children and descendants. At least that might be what you'd like to generate on the fly like this. But recall that XSLT1 actually stores this in what's known as an RTF, which is a fairly useless data type, which is why there exists in Zalin. For instance, a, an extension function that allows you to deal with this. And in XSLT2, there will be ways of actually generating node sets in this fairly intuitive way and avoiding this RTF issue altogether. But for now, if you're stuck with an XSLT1 processor or application, notice that the interesting part of this example is right at the very end, lines 19 through 21. And again, for your reference, this is simply on the XSLT extension functions link that was provided in last week's lecture notes for your reference. Just scroll down, just do a control F for node set to find the example. So in line 19, we have a typical for each. We're selecting what? If you could, someone translate this into English. Sure. We're, we're looking at the variable that's created. OK, looking at the variable that's created. Okay, so let me just reiterate, especially for our mic here, we have the node set extension function that's clearly being called on that RTF. What is this going to return then? It's going to return a node set, but be more specific. Put it in context. What is returned here? All the end elements. All right, well, the next thing seems to be a step along the child access for the doc elem. So, it's returning the root then of that RTF. Just, right, because notice you can sort of infer from the example if the next thing you're doing is taking a step saying choose the doc elem, well think after all what we said variables are able to do. We used the, a variable for instance when we wanted to source essentially an, another XML document last week with that brief example and we said that if you wanted to read the contents of some other file, foo.xml, you could define a variable called foo and use that uh, document function and specify foo.xml, what do you get in that foo variable? Well, you got the root of the document, and from there you could take a step down into the root element and the any of the children. And so, same idea here. 
you are at this point. So what this is actually returning is a node set, a generic node, the first child of which is this doc elem. Just as though you had stored in a variable, not the root element of a document, but the root of the document. Uh, not yet, no, because there's yet another step. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, yes, I was ignoring this for now. The first step was to grab this root element. I see a hand going up. Yeah, okay. uh, can a node have more than one root element? Is that that restriction? No. So, a document cannot have more than one root element. So, an RTF uh, can either. Uh, correct in this case. Um, okay, so now we have this weird sort of step. What is this implying? Slash, slash, star. Not even just the children, every element. In effect, this, this implies what axis, slash, slash? Descendant or self. So included then in the resulting node set is not only all of the descendants, it's also this guy. So in effect, it's all of the elements, all of the nodes from, or all of the elements from that RTF. Well, what are we doing then? Well, the Zalin example is iterating over each of those nodes, and line 20 here has the effect of doing what? Comma separating the, uh, no, no, the, the, element names. the element names. So essentially you're getting a comma separated list of all of the element names that were in this RTF. So specifically you're getting what? Uh, careful. Doc elem, comma, elem1, comma, elem1a, so forth in document order. Okay, so this is just one example, but for, dare say, those of you who have been struggling perhaps with RTFs, if you forgot or you were determined to take an approach like this, one context in which they're useful is to deploy this node set function. But again, that should hopefully be a problem of the past. I've actually made great use of the trigonometric functions that I mentioned when doing some work with SVG a couple of years ago, where long story short, we had in the computer science building a whole bunch of moats, which are these tiny little embedded hardware devices that are used in what are called sensor networks. We had laced them throughout the building, maybe 30 or 50 of these devices. They have little radio transceivers and they all talk to one another and form a sort of mesh network. And our goal was to measure the strength of the signals between two arbitrary nodes, A and B, and we wanted to visualize this. We had a floor plan of Maxwell Dworkin, the computer science building. We knew physically the locations of these devices, so we knew the X, Y coordinates with respect to this floor plan. What we wanted to then do was dynamically update, say, an XML file with the current strength readings, which we could assess empirically using radio receivers, and then we wanted to dynamically overlay on this floor plan some lines. Red if we had a strong connection between two nodes, red if uh, red if we had a weak connection, green if we had a strong connection, yellow if we had a weak connection. So really what you have here is a geometric sort of puzzle where you have all these arbitrary points and you want to draw lines and you want to do it at the right angle and you might want to offset the lines a certain thickness and so forth. So using things like arc sine, arc tan, sine, cosine, all of those prove to be quite useful. You wouldn't necessarily expect them to be built into a language. For instance, in the C standard library, there is no sign function. You would have to deploy the math library. But similarly, does XSLT allow you to extend its own capabilities, not only with these uh, processor-based extensions, but also with your own. If you wanted to write some Java code that accepted in effect a node set as its input, you could effectively invoke your own Java code within your style sheet. But what you do have to be aware using uh, extension functions is that the processor you're to run your code on will actually run those extension functions, whether it's your own or Zalin. For instance, couldn't use this, say, in Saxon, if Saxon didn't also support the Zalin namespace and its extension functions. But it's useful, especially if you find great value in XSLT but might otherwise put it aside for fear of not being able to achieve some task it probably is in fact possible through extensions. So last time we spent a good amount of time on XSLT. Um, whole laundry list of sorts of stuff here. Rather than belabor the point and spend too much time looking back on last week, thought I'd let you, the audience, pick off uh, maybe three or five of the easiest topics to address just to get the uh, juices flowing as we dive further into XSL related stuff today. So pick your favorite topic. Play a little game here. Someone picks the topic, someone else gets to answer a question. First part's easier. Topic. 
Copying nodes. Okay, your question for $200 is there is a distinction between the copy and copy of XSLT elements, which was what? Someone else. Uh, depth, uh, deep or shallow copy. Essentially copy the current node or copy everything below it. Good, next topic for $400. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, which templates, sorry? A oh, built-in templates, good one. All right, so built-in templates. Um, sorry? There are three built-in templates. Let me ask it. Okay, so uh, true is my answer. How about um, slightly juicier, just to hone in on the specifics, there's one built-in template that arguably jump starts the entire recursive nature that really is XSLT, and that built-in template matches on what? Good. Root, bar, star. Root or star, the union of the two. And that's really what kickstarts that whole recursive process that if you played back, for instance, the podcast or the real audio or real video files, hopefully that story, if you did in fact go back to review it, if you continue to ask yourself that story, it helps, I think, to walk through exactly or to determine what templates are instantiated when and which one gets called when, for instance, you have potential conflicts or coincidences of templates. forces you to, because if you just match on the, the, the star or, you know, the, the root or star mm -hmm. or anything else, it just matches. But it's the, the, the second line, the one that forces you to go into the, the children. Ah, uh, yes. That, 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 that's actually what's causing you to output the end. Correct. There is one line in that first built-in template that in itself induces the recursion, and that's that generic call to the XSLT element called apply templates, apply templates. And in our original example, it just said apply templates slash close bracket. That was it. But that's because there is an assumed select attribute, which in that case was, and this is what, child colon colon star. And that really was the process that jump started everything. At this point, I would say if you're sort of struggling or a little confused on how some things with XSLT flow, it's not crucial, I think, to understand that particular story, especially if you're taking more of a pull-based approach, which is really what we've preached in some of our examples. And by that, I mean having one main template that matches the root, and then just sort of logically implementing what data you want to pull out of your document thereafter. But I think as you get more savvy with this, it is useful to really understand the application of those templates and why they're invoked in the order they are. And it really boils down to those built-in templates. So that was a juicy one. That was worth way more than 400. One last topic to pluck off. What else was uh, interesting or you think hard for the person next to you last week? Patterns. Um, patterns, where, let's see, patterns, patterns, patterns. So patterns was, I think, in the context last week of what we matched on, I think is what we meant by that. So what was in between the match? Yeah, exactly. So not interesting. Yeah, we'll pick another one. One more, one more. Multiple source documents. OK, so typically the world of XSLT involves this very simple equation, XML plus XSLT equals something else, where that something else is probably XML of some sort or ASCII text of some sort, or really anything that you can generate. But sometimes it's useful to apply XSLT plus multiple XML documents. And doing this inside of XSLT itself, there is a mechanism. And this is what function allows you to access another document. So import or include would allow you to include another XSLT document into your file, similar to sharp include in C or C++ or in effect import in Java. But I think the question here was more about import, including or accessing another XML input document, not an XSLT document per se. The document function. And we typically use this with what XSLT element to get access to the contents of some foo.xml? The variable. It was as simple as that. So XSL variable, you might say at the top of your file, um, Let's see, name equals foo, and then select, and this is where the magic happens, document 
parenthesis, be careful of the quotes, use single quotes now, foo.xml. And now you have a variable called dollar sign foo. And if you then said later in your document, in like a select statement, something like dollar sign foo slash bar, what does this have the effect of selecting? You're, no, I think you're right. I thought you were going to say more. So it's, an, it's assuming that there exists in foo.xml a root element called bar. If you want to be lazy but exhaustive, you might say slash slash bar, and that would find a bar element anywhere. That might be fine if all your document contains is bar elements, and you, the programmer, know this isn't going to be inefficient inherently, but often that's a, a dangerous approach to take. And one teaser or advice I'll offer outside of context is that you might find, especially if you're having performance related issues with Xtube in particular, where really the cleverness and the intelligence of your selections and your XPath queries really start to make a difference as to how much time you're spending on this project and how much time you're watching a little hourglass go by. You might find such elements as XSL key useful. This essentially allows you to, to define a hash key of sorts on a data set that would, with a good XSLT processor, allow it to do some pre-processing so that you could expedite certain queries or queries of a certain type. For instance, queries of the form, find me the neighbors of this station or find me the um, actors in this movie. And I'll leave it at that because it's a, it certainly by no means requisite to do a decent job on performance with both of those aspects of the project. But if you look at the W3 schools reference or really at any of the couple of several references we have for XSL, you'll see some nice little examples. And it's not a hard thing to use by any means and it really borrows from the spirit of any sort of key-based database lookups. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The param, um, uh, uh, the param, uh, so make it using call templates or? Right, you call it like sort of made that, someone said you don't really need the variable. Absolutely. You know, it's like the param actually took care of a lot of the problem of not being able to write over variables. Absolutely. Over over. So I mean, I just thought that it was, uh, I thought that the, the fact that you couldn't do that with variables I mean, why, why, would, why would they not have that feature in XSLT? Like, I mean, it makes no sense to not be able to have. Uh, well, it's a feature in a lot of functional programming languages, not to have mutable state, where the world is defined not by behavior and side effects, but rather by the generation of values, which is what XSLT and Lisp, for instance, are all about. So the solution you propose to this issue of non mutability of variables is perhaps the de facto one, which is to use recursion, which is to effectively use your stack, your call stack, so that you allocate implicitly some additional memory space for yourself. So the, the workaround there, say, that you found is actually the approach or the correct spirit for a language like this. And the iterative nature of XSLT is not quite as consistent with, for instance, what might be something more reminiscent of pure Lisp. I mean, even Lisp allows you to do iteration, but that's not quite in the spirit of the core of the language. So short answer, it does by no means, this non-mutability of variables, by no means restricts you or prevents you from doing certain things. It's simply a different model of programming, different approach. That's a good discovery to realize yourself. Getting back to the key. Sure. I've definitely noticed that it spends some time watching. What I don't want to do is spend a lot of time trying to speed it up and then find out that maybe it was going fast enough. Mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering, what do you think is a lot of time and a little time? That's a good question. What, what, is, what makes some, where do we draw the line between slow, bad code, and reasonable, fine code? I would say based on our own implementations of this over the past couple of years, even as processor speeds have been increasing, if you're watching, if you're sitting there waiting for more than a minute, certainly two minutes, it's too slow. I think it's more reasonable on a typical computer today, P3, P4, if you're processing of a large document is taking 17 seconds, 30 seconds, uh, perhaps reasonable, especially if the context here is this generation of a fairly large 
data set, where in the real world, it would be acceptable to take 15, 30 seconds to generate this, assuming the output is something that quite reasonably could be cached. And certainly the spec we've given you for Xtube is the sort of page that's not dynamically changing. The user is not providing input per se. And so it's perfectly reasonable to spend a bit more upfront cost on processing it to subsequently then keep it around. We don't ask you to keep it around. But you'll see when we move to projects three and four and start doing things more interactive and still use XSLT to some extent, you're not going to want the user at their browser sitting there for 15 or 30 seconds. Then it's going to become much more important to expedite things along. So I would say I would arbitrarily draw the line at, say, a minute or two. You can go back to the drawing board and improve upon that. And frankly, I mean, there's a nice equilibrium problem there where you could leave it alone, but then testing your code is going to take you a minute or two. But spending five minutes optimizing it might save you a minute or two. Um, OK. Um, this time. So namespaces in XML. This is something we've been looking at or using all this while. Namespaces are probably something familiar to you anyway in other languages, C++, Java effectively, and, and others as well. We'll look tonight at SVG, which is a really neat and really simple, I would say, XML markup language that allows you to generate vector-based graphics. Not necessarily the sort of language you'd want to implement 3D games in, but certainly something that is great for charts, even for interactive type program, certainly excellent for charting and maps, which is one of the things you'll use it for. And again, very easy, I think, to pick up and very intuitive. XSLFO, on the other hand, I find to be a very cumbersome and difficult language to pick up. The syntax of it is far more arcane and sort of a XML sort of approach to something like PostScript or PDF, which it might just be my sort of distaste for such minutia of formatting details that makes this language a bit scary for me. But I do think there's a lot more to that. You can spend half a course on something like XSLFO and markup because it really is more about um, the markup of document or the sort of uh, abstract implementation of formatting rules that's not specific to something like PostScript, not specific to a Microsoft Word document. And we'll see tonight that one of the beauties of something like XSLFO is that you really have a language or machine independent approach, though XML based, way of marking up a document and subsequently formatting it for printing or on screen display in PDF, in Illustrator format, in um, HTML format, in any number of formats, PostScript as well, um, and so forth. So we'll actually generate a couple of those tonight and we'll make use of XSLFO in the next couple of projects. Um, if only because it's a useful XML-based language for generating things like PDFs. And if you're already operating in a world which it's useful to continue to deploy XSLT and to make use of data that's already in XML markup and you might want to generate, say, for project four, a receipt of sorts, well, we'll introduce you to some of the very basic skills with which you can do so in the same context without having to pick up something more. But we won't spend as much time on XSLFO. And we'll teach this one, I think, mostly by example because there's so much more, I think, complexity to it than you'll see in SVG. Um, and project two, we'll touch upon quite briefly. There have been um, all too few emails, I would say, going back across the listserv. And I say this not because the project is inherently hard or confusing, but I say this having seen how many emails flew across the listserv last project. So I know what volume the, the class is, dare say, capable of. So I look forward, perhaps, to a, a week's worth of fun emails this coming week. Um, but do realize that this third installment of the project is all about SVG generation. Again, not hard. You can implement this part of the project in you know, this many lines of code. Uh, harder, perhaps, is, or more important, perhaps, is understanding the concepts and knowing where to start. But realize that none of the project, that your code will be shorter than the project spec itself. Realize if you are feeling like maybe you should have spent more time the past couple of weeks. But with that said, namespaces in XML pretty much was a notion that shipped with XML itself. And you've been making use of it. Um, not encouraging when I see stairs going back across the room like, oh, yeah, we should have started last week, shouldn't we? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You could just write a little random number generator type thing, cast it to ASCII, and uh, you might get out some XML format, formatted documents just fine. So here's a very simple example that allows us to discuss namespaces and hopefully tease apart the most complicated part of it, which is why don't these URLs lead anywhere? 
usually. Well, here is a document that has a root element called foo. But this root element is prefixed with a namespace. Now, you've probably not seen the CSCI 259 namespace before, let alone an XML spec, but that's because we just decided to invent it here. So essentially, namespaces allow you to scope elements to what's called a certain namespace, which is particularly useful when, one, you want to implement a program, a processor, that understands certain instructions in a particular way. You might want to write your own language, maybe reminiscent of XSLT, that has its own style sheet element, or its own template element, or its own variable element, but you don't want that to be confused with the significance that XSLT imposes on that word element, or style sheet, or template, or variable. So namespaces allow you to, in the typical programmatic sense, isolate your variables, or your templates, and your elements in this case, to their own namespace. Which is to say, ideally now, this element called foo, because it's been bound to the CSCIE 259 namespace, is not going to be confused with someone else's definition of the foo element. How did we make this association? The standard way is to use the XML and S attribute, followed by a colon, a single colon, CSCIE 259 in this case, which declares the prefix that you want to deploy, and then equals quote unquote something. This something, in short, need only be a unique string. The world has simply standardized on using URIs, or really URLs, because there's presumably this assumption that if you use a URL, as your namespace identifier, and you are the owner of that URL, just probabilistically, what other guy is going to choose your domain's URL and that specific path for his own namespace? So it's sort of a convenient way for the world to prevent namespace collisions, right? Only use a namespace if you've paid the 695 for that domain name, and that sort of inherently guarantees uniqueness. The URLs don't necessarily need to lead anywhere. In fact, if you paste that into a browser, it will give you a file not found, because that's not the point. They don't refer necessarily to actual files, it just needs to be a unique string. And so what people will tend to do is to use the implicit hierarchy of a URL and directory structure so to, as to keep their own multiple namespaces perhaps distinct, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a path to a file or a directory. So point of confusion, but it actually works out in the end quite well because who else in their right mind is going to choose that as a namespace identifier? It's a nice way of teasing thing of keeping things separate. Now the question is, the bar element that follows, in what namespace is this bar element? Well, sort of a strange question, but it does matter because if you pipe this input through an XSLT processor or an E259 processor, you probably want to know what will happen to your foo element or your bar element, which ones will actually get processed, which ones will get kicked through raw. Okay, so we have on the left here a proposal that the bar element is going to assume the namespace of the foo element, that is the E259 namespace, because it's a child. So that's the agree. Now give me a disagree, just so we can have a debate. Yeah? You say it would be in the default namespace. I will perhaps answer this with an example. The out element is in what namespace? It's going to be a raw date. It's going to be just outputted without being processed. And think of how many times we've seen this structure, right? Forget this particular Zalin example. Consider your own examples or your own work, which probably has had things like this in there. Well, in what namespace is HTML? If it's in the, Zale, if it's in the XSL namespace, just because it's a child of XSL template, probably problematic because Zalin, as an XSLT processor, doesn't know what an HTML element means. What does know what an HTML element is? What kind of type of program? A browser, right? So and that's the whole distinction. So it's a reasonable suggestion, but in fact, we've seen the answer before. And if you don't have a prefix to an element, it is in fact, no, it, it is in, fact in what's known as the default namespace. So it is requisite to actually include that prefix. Now, where does the inherent meaning of XSL colon? Well, even though every example I've given you for XSLT has used XSL colon, 
I could have just put this for every one of your examples and ever so immodestly associated every one of these elements with a David prefix so long as I make one slight change. Now you have a very egocentric set of lecture examples but that are still fully functional and still perfectly consistent with the XSLT or really XML specification because the prefix you choose is meaningless. It is in that XML NS attribute colon prefix that you're specifying that this prefix is to be associated with this namespace. It is then the job of the XSLT processor to look at first not just the prefix up there but the namespace and to recognize oh it looks like this guy who implemented this document that I'm in the process of processing is going to be doing something with the namespace that is uniquely identified as http colon slash slash www.w3.org slash 1999 slash sxl slash transform. In Zalin's lookup table then will be probably some kind of flag that says, ah, that is the unique string that the world has decided means XSLT. It's not a URL per se. It is a URL, but it doesn't mean it exists anywhere in the world. I know because I was implemented to be an XSLT processor that I need to look for this hard-coded string in a document. If I see it, I then say, all right, anytime I see David colon in the document, assume that element belongs to that namespace and then process that element in accordance with the rules of that namespace, which in this case are going to be whatever the rules are of XSLT 1.0. So sort of a mouthful. But, you know, perhaps less silly than this particular example would be you sometimes see things like just XS. Or we'll see other namespace, namespace prefixes that the world has generally just agreed on standards, but just because it's convenient to always see XSL colon. But that in and of itself is meaningless. In fact, what we could even do here is specify the default namespace to be something other than it is. There is, in fact, no default namespace explicitly mentioned here. But if I simply did this, XML NS equals quote unquote, that is a way of specifying what the default namespace really should be. Because I've specified no prefix with the colon syntax, that means now any element that has no prefix shall be assumed to be in that namespace, which means now you could actually write your style sheet without any of these prefixes altogether. But a problem now arises, and this is why we tend not to do this with XSLT, now your processor is going to throw an error because it's not going to recognize the HTML namespace. So you could fix that by saying, well, this is the web colon HTML element, web colon. And then up here, you could define another XML NS attribute for uh, web that equals the namespace identifier for HTML4 or for XHTML1 or whatever that particular language happens to be. But uh, less straightforward, I would say. I think the approach we've taken is a little clearer. Yeah? Okay. I, it, should, it would likely remain in the same namespace, but the version attribute would then govern how the processor actually behaves. And so we've seen this version attribute elsewhere, even in the XML declaration for the XML parser itself. Okay. The namespace, you said, doesn't mean, doesn't have a as long as you need. Correct. But you just said that by having that up there, the XML transform, it knows to use the 1.0 so it has to be unique for you, the implementer. So that string is unique insofar as the W3C is never going to use that string, presumably, for anything other than its XSLT recommendation. If I, Joe user off the street, wants to myself implement my own XSLT processor, because I really dislike Zalin, I really dislike Saxon, and I really think I can do a better job, well, I simply then need to, and I want to support, rather, um, certain extension functions that are only specific to my processor, I simply have to associate those extension functions, for instance, with my own namespace, which quite simply could be David's 
namespace. But again, that's not really adhering to any sort of pattern. Not answering this well. If when I say that the namespace URL must be unique, it must be unique only so that a program parsing this document, processing this document, knows how to behave for those elements. If I were to myself implement another recommendation for the world, let's not say implementation of XSLT, but another XML-based language, and I write my own recommendation and say, I recommend to the world that you use this language for processing XML, and just to be obnoxious, I choose to associate my new language with this namespace. That's hugely problematic because now if you try to process instances of my language, that is documents written in .dav for instance, they will be confused with those elements from the XSLT namespace. So a program wouldn't necessarily know, do I process this foo element with the XSLT processor or with David's processor? Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, they do have special meaning, and if I were myself to implement my own XSLT processor that is supportive of the W3C's recommendation for XSLT, somewhere in my implementation of my own XSLT processor would be that string, because I'm going to need to grep for it, essentially, in any input document to decide which elements to treat as XSL and which to treat as unknown or raw elements. So in your, in your application there, mm -hmm. Okay. So that would process based on the XSLT standard. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But if I, for whatever reason, chose to change this URL to be www.w3.org and so forth, and then I fed this to an XSLT processor, these elements would not be outputted as raw. Rather, Zalen would try, for instance, to part to process the foo element. Well, built into XSLT is not an element called foo, so Zalen would throw an error. However, if I didn't associate it with, Z with XSLT's namespace, but just left it as this, passed it to an XSLT processor, its behavior should be just to kick out those elements raw, as we've seen with HTML. Right? They are not parsed, or they are not processed. Because Zalen doesn't know what that pro namespace means, so it just retains the namespace and kicks out the elements in their original format. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I, that was a listserv question as well, which I thought we had resolved. So perhaps not. It's what's happening there, most likely. I don't recall all of the specifics of the note, but when you're getting output of the form XML and S equals quote unquote, that usually means that the default namespace elsewhere has been specified to be something other than it should be for that element to which this attribute's been attached. So by doing this in the output, it's saying this element belongs to no namespace, not to the one that's currently in context. So if you're still seeing that and you want to forward, if appropriate, to the listserv or to me directly what code is actually outputting these results, I can explain in the context now of namespaces why that's happening. It's, you, it's probably a simple change would fix it. Yeah? Okay. That was outputting some HTML element. Okay. And uh, I guess in the uh, in your root template that you had provided, that has an X HTML that has a default namespace. I think of that's an XHTML namespace, and so that was generating an HTML element. Okay. That had that for the default namespace. So I think what was happening was when the XSLT processor was putting uh, these other HTML elements under that. Okay. Uh, in the XSLT doc, in the context of the XSLT document style sheet, that didn't have the XHTML namespace associated with it. Okay. So if I follow, that could all be quite true, but let me see it actually in context, and then I can speak with certainty as to whether it was, it could be some tag of code that I included that's making things harder because I could have written it differently. So. We can, I can take a look. If you've seen this, forward it to me or forward it to the listserv if it's not too proprietary on your part. So to the story at hand, bar is then in what namespace? 
the default namespace, which if you haven't actually specified a default namespace for our purposes is just quote unquote. That's what it would actually show up as. Um, Baz is in what namespace? default namespace, because recall we've actually seen this prefix approach in attributes already, so attributes certainly my own could be associated with a namespace, often they're not for various reasons, but for now this is in no namespace as well. What about Google? What namespace? Default, but Fugle is in the E259 namespace explicitly. Now what is the utility of all this? Well out of context it's just a little strange. But you can imagine, hopefully, a processor that would treat the Fugle attribute in a certain way if it's associated with this namespace. For instance, that might simply govern how the Oogle element is actually outputted if associated with it is this CSCI E259 Fugle attribute. You may have seen in some documents an XML colon uh, space, uh, S-P-A-C-E attribute, which is something that's built into XML that you actually see recurring in other languages, sometimes SVG or XSLT, and having the XML colon prefix associated with that allows a processor to realize, oh, this is an attribute whose behavior is defined in the XML spec, not in the current, say, w, uh, XSLT specification. If that's not quite clear, don't worry about it for now because we'll see through future examples, especially when we look at Xlink, why that's useful. But for now, just know that it's possible. And follow, ultimately, when you close that element, you have to retain the prefix as well. You can't just close it as slash foo if you opened it. Inside of the. Okay. Why does it need to enclose them like that? Here? Right, if you just took them out and put them below, it would get confused when it saw the CSCI 259 Google? Um, I'm not quite sure I'm following. Why is foo and Google indented in below the foo element? Why do they have to be children? Bar part? Oh, they don't need to be. This is just, well, they need to be in the sense that a document, if this is an XML document, can only have one root element. Right. So they can't follow. Oh, sure, sure. Why are they here in this case? It's because I wanted an example that we could discuss. They mean, they mean the same thing inside or outside? Who knows what they mean, frankly. They're just raw data elements that ha probably have some meaning. Right. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Yes. An excellent point because notice we've defined the CSCI E259 prefix where, just to restate it, in the foo element. Well, similar to many instances of scoping, so is that prefix only in scope for that element foo and all of its descendants. Which is to say if we did move, as you hypothesize, something like the bar element outside of the foo element, as maybe a sibling of but not child of, then your processor would likely throw an error if this is in fact the sole contents of the file if, uh, for at least one reason, which is that the prefix is no longer in scope outside of the foo element. It's a little weird, yes. The, to restate, you, you can define a prefix as an attribute of an element and then in a sense retroactively apply that prefix to the current element. But you can't do it outside of the element. Can't do it out. You could have de we could have defined that prefix earlier in the document. You, you clearly that namespace applies for anything within the element. Yes. Apply it to the name of the element. Yes. No, but that's why you've seen in our XSLT templates, uh, our default files that we've provided with lecture examples and the projects, we often put this namespace stuff in the root element of the whole document so that it is in effect in the scope everywhere. It's a good distinction to make. Defaulting, well, we've pretty much covered this verbally. In this case, we've specified a default namespace of that long URI. But again, it's just really in, uh, in conversation, we would just call that the E259 namespace, perhaps, as identified by that thing. Question now is, in what namespace is foo? Uh, 
E259 namespace. Why? Well, in the absence of a prefix, you said a minute ago it's in the default namespace. In this case, the default namespace is not quote unquote, so to speak, but rather the E259 namespace. In what namespace is bar? E259. Again, no prefix means it's in the default namespace. Default namespace is ours. Oogle. Same answer. Getting easy. Baz. All right, good. You're hedging, or at least getting ever so more, ever so quieter. Um, attributes are not in the default namespace in the absence of a prefix. They're not associated with any namespace, which is good, which is bad. Um, can be a nuisance for implementation because what this means is that if you're writing a processor that processes bar elements, well, typically that processor would just assume that, ele that attributes of that element should be in the same namespace, even though in XML terms, in terms of the recommendation, they're not actually in any namespace. So it's just kind of assumed that they should be. However, if, it do, if a processor sees that Baz is in, the, uh, in a separate prefix where it's explicitly not in the current namespace, well, that can be useful. But long story short, this really only is an, a matter of concern for those of you who might actually implement a processor for, say, your own meta language that's XML based. But no, for now, attributes, even though they have no prefix, are not, necess are not then in the default namespace as elements are. Okay, question here, then there. Mm -hmm. Where do you need to define your own namespace? For the purposes of the projects, for instance, you will not need to define your own namespaces. In the real world, In the real world you might implement your own namespace if you, for instance, have an XML document that is a purchase order, for instance. And inside of a purchase order, and this will make more sense perhaps when we get to DTDs and schemas where you're defining, your, in effect, your own meta languages that have their own specifications, you might put a purchase order, which might have a PO element as the root element, uh, might have an email element for the email address of whoever's ordering something, it might have a street element for the street address, a zip, all these kinds of things. Well, you'd probably, if you're implementing your own specification for what it means to be a purchase order, probably want to assign all of those elements to a namespace, particularly so that if that data is ever integrated with other data or sent to another vendor, after all, you might have someone else fulfilling your purchase orders, you want the receiving application to be able to keep distinct your elements from, say, their own elements. If they have their own XML feed into which they're integrating yours, it allows you to tease things apart. Those of you who have ever published podcasts or actually looked closely at our own podcast feed, well, E1's podcast, first of all, a podcast, if you haven't appreciated already, is nothing more than Apple's buzzword around put a bunch of MP3s in a folder and call it a podcast, right? A podcast really is an XML file, an RSS file specifically, that contains links to and descriptions of and names for and durations of and so forth all of the f files in that particular directory. So a podcast is nothing more than a feed of MP3s and now movies and PDFs and so forth. But if you look at, on our own podcast page, the RSS link, when you subscribe to a podcast, in effect, you're telling iTunes, for instance, every day or every hour or every time I launch iTunes, re grab the latest copy of E259's podcast file. So in fact, though you don't see it up here, this is actually an alias, this URL, for xml slash itunes.xml, which is the same file. So this is our podcast in the most literal sense. Well, what does it mean to be a podcast? Well, again, to reference files. So the last thing I added to the podcast was last week a t an item called ti uh, which has a child title, section four, project two. It has a link, which is to the actual MP3. It has an enclosure, which is, again, a re repetition of that URL, but it also specifies the MIME type. It also specifies the file length and some other stuff. The relevance to the conversation at hand is that up in the top of this file and elsewhere, it's a little small to see here, but you'll see some raw elements like item and title and link and description, which are um, sort of standard XML tags in some namespace. We could see if we scrolled up higher, but then you also see some iTunes specific tags, which is how iTunes has essentially augmented the definition of an RSS feed with iTunes specific 
metadata by associating that iTunes prefix with this namespace, the podcast 1.0 DTD, whereas everything else is RSS, according to the RSS definition, and that's why the root element here is RSS. The child of that is channel. Inside of a channel is a whole bunch of metadata, but then eventually a whole bunch of items. So another use of namespaces, distinguishing the owners, for instance, of elements um, and perhaps the nature of elements. Namespaces might also be useful too if you want to make clear the fact that a title in this context with this prefix is the title of a song. A title in this context with this prefix is the title of a person, Mr., Ms., Mrs., and so forth. Useful there as well. No, in this case, the default namespace is actually assumed to be, it seems, it's not even hard-coded here, um, the default namespace is nothing, quote, unquote. The iTunes prefix, however, has been associated with the namespace of this URI. So the implication here is that when you pass this particular file to an RSS processor, like iTunes now is, it's going to assume that everything in the default namespace, quote unquote, should just be processed as RSS, is the assumption. So any element without a prefix belongs to the default namespace. That's the rule, which in this case is not specified as a URI, so it's just for our purposes, quote unquote. So it, does, it doesn't, in effect, get a namespace in this particular example. The RSS processor, iTunes in this case, is simply going to assume that any elements in the default namespace belong to RSS and should be processed as such. For instance, you, there's a similar behavior in browsers, right? You don't necessarily, in code you've written, have had, you've not necessarily had an XML NS equals quote unquote the URI for XHTML1 or HTML4. Right, you've probably not yourself manually written that in, but browsers nonetheless parse your HTML element, your body element, your head element, even though they are not in any specific namespace other than the default. Well, there too, the browser's default assumption is if it's not in a namespace, I'll deal with it. Same thing here for, say, iTunes. If it's in the default namespace, I'll deal with it. Yeah. If you run this to a process that doesn't know what iTunes, magic iTunes thing is, Good question. So if I use a client like iPodder, which is another um, podcast client that's um, available for multiple platforms, and there's many, many others these days, um, what would happen if that client, not being iTunes, encountered an iTunes, iTunes prefix? Um, the short answer is that it should ignore it. Since it's not an XML parser, it's not a uh, serializer, it shouldn't spit it out in any way, it should just ignore it if it doesn't understand it. And so this is how we are able to use this iTunes feed, or rather this RSS feed with these iTunes specific tags, but it doesn't trip up the rest of the world. For instance, if you search for on Google, computer science E259 podcast, if we're as popular as we hope, you'll actually see a whole bunch of other websites, which in effect are RSS parsers out there. They're just providing with an HTML-based view of the same feed that have similarly parsed our file, but for the most part have ignored the iTunes-specific tags. So the default behavior would be ignored if you don't understand it. You, can, you throw an error, though, when you encounter something that doesn't belong in the namespace that you think it should. So if you had a foo element without a prefix in this RSS file, that's probably a problem because it's not an RSS element. And so if it's in that namespace and it's trying to be treated as an RSS element and it's not, that's an error. But if it's in some other namespace, eh, not my problem. All right, so great questions. I know there's at least one other outstanding, but let's go ahead and take our five minute break. Now, that was, uh, that was a juicy conversation on namespaces, who'd have thought XML NS was so interesting, but hopefully now the different roles that different languages and these tags play is a bit more clear. We now have the luxury of getting to look at some pretty pictures, or at least some simple pictures. So SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. Vector is in contrast with most of the graphical file formats that you're probably familiar with. Most graphical file formats are not vector-based, but rather what types of images. 
Yeah, what are called bitmaps, which kind of captures the definition in and of itself. It's a map of bits, or really pixels, as you might say. Just to put this into perspective and to make clear the power of a vector-based language, here on the left is some random photograph of the top of a snowy mountain. Well, that was stored in JPEG format, most likely. Maybe GIF at that size, but probably JPEG format, which supports millions of colors and is useful for things like photographs, probably the most popular format for them. If, however, you wanted to zoom in on that mountain peak, using a bitmap file format, you get this very pixelated image, which in fact is a blown up version of the top of the mountain, but looks quite a mess. Um, despite what you see on TV, on Law and & Order and CSI, digital cameras do not have infinite zoom and you can't just click a button and do this sort of thing and then they can digitally enhance it and see the guy's license plate all the way, uh, you know, 50 feet away. You see this and you're only going to see this. Maybe a smart computer could interpolate it a little bit but that is how much information is in the original file. You are not going to see a guy waving at you on the top of the mountain if that's how many dots of information you had in the first place. So a weakness then of course of any bitmap file format is its inability to scale, certainly to scale to arbitrary proportions. This is a silly additional little example where this too is a screenshot of these four horses standing around talking. It was in the GIF file format and it too, if blown up, begins to look rather blurry. Uh, I'm not sure how this will come out on camera, but certainly blown up to this size, it's not crystal clear, it's fuzzy. And this is because though it has been blown up, um, and I think this might even be uh, this could have even been in JPEG format because it's getting blurry even though it's, um, it doesn't look so much pixelated as it looks blurry. So there might have been some interpolation on the part of, say, I suggest JPEG because you get some fuzziness effect here. But if you look quite closely, not so much on the overhead but on my laptop screen, so this is making for a great demonstration for myself here, you do actually see that these are not smooth lines connecting the horse's face and nose and so forth, but rather are beginning to get blotchy, similar in spirit to the mountaintop. If, however, oh, and the relevance of le that, lest it seem completely out of left field, was simply to demonstrate something I've always thought is quite cute, which is the four horses, even though that was a screenshot of them in GIF or JPEG format, this, the original is actually a shockwave file, which similarly is vector based. Um, well, let's see, they don't just do that. Oh, I think it's just very quiet. Let's try this again. This, mind you, is completely off topic. <laughs> <laughs> so if you time it right and click the guy's mouths right, uh, see, done. and you time it right, you can have a nice little acapella concert here in vector-based file format. So let's see if we can get it right. And finally, we got to do it on the right beat. There we go. Not bad. Good hand-eye coordination. Anyhow. Rather irrelevant, but kind of adorable. Um, but notice that in contrast with the previous version, which was a blown up version of that screenshot, you're probably wondering what the hell is going on. <laughs> Unlike the screenshot, which I blew up to fill the screen, this image, hopefully, to you on fi those of you watching at home and those of you in the audience here, it's pretty clear and it's scaled pretty well. If I turn off the full screen mode and make this thing pretty small, it's similarly retaining its sharpness. And that's because shockwave files, this one certainly is stored in what's called vector-based format, which essentially means that these several horses are stored as mathematical formula. They're not stored as bit maps, rather that is dots depicting their various features, but rather with a series of equations, polygons, lines, call it whatever you want, implement it however you want, but they scale well because you're essentially scaling by some constant factor. And for the dramatic ending, oh, I missed a beat. Ah, oh well. In any case, you can download uh, from our own little e E259 website, those of you uh, who'd like to play along at home. So the relevance, can we come up with some relevance here? The relevance is that scalable vector graphics, as the acronym suggests, are similar in spirit to what you just saw as a little shockwave demonstration in that when you define um, polygons and lines and shapes in SVG, you actually get an infinite scalability capability because what you're ultimately representing things as 
is lines and formulas and equations of circles, of ellipses and so forth. So for those of you who would like to do a, a bang up job on the SVG aspect of uh, Xtube, if you're scared of geometry, you might not want to go beyond the simple circles, which you'll find are quite easy to implement, um, as are the lines. Straight lines are not hard to implement, but you can really start to do some interesting things, especially when you have the power of Zeeland's, say, uh, trigonometric functions. By no means requisite for the project. You don't need to know geometry for E259, but you can start to do some really interesting things when, after all, a lot of the most interesting graphic uh, engines today are based at least in part on scalable vector graphics so that you can run a game for instance in an arbitrary number of resolutions whether 640 by 480 or 1600 by 1200 and have things scale quite nicely. Um, to display SVG in the truest sense you need what's called an SVG viewer. Perhaps the best one at least for a few platforms is Adobe's own which you can download for free. It's linked on the course's website. So far as project Two is concerned, we do ask and require that your SVG be viewable with this viewer, even though we link on the course's website to a bunch of other alternatives for Linux and so forth. Um, but the value in SVG, this of course can be a downside, right? It's kind of annoying to require visitors to your website to download a plugin just so that they can see your SVG. But realize there is, um, there exist tools, which are actually one of which is mentioned in the project spec, that allow you to take SVG output and convert it to something like uh, PDF to GIF to JPEG, which is a useful thing indeed, so that you can use the power of the language to generate the image and then output it in a format that does not require some, say, special support. Um, this is a teaser of some of the types of things you'll do in Xtube's remaining part. This is a very simplified representation of the tube, right? So London's underground. We have the source of this thing listed here and I offer this just so that you can get a bit of a visual for how your Xtube implementations will actually look different from the maps that you've been provided with. Realize that the maps that you've been provided with don't contain the coordinates that you see on your nice pretty two-sided map that we handed out earlier and is linked as PDFs on the course's website. Rather, you're given the XY coordinates in terms of geography. So you get the literal coordinates. This is the nice user-friendly version. If you look at the, M the sign in the MBTA, at least the original MBTA sign for the subway system was even farther removed from reality than the current one is, but that's usually useful when you can actually lay things out in a nice grid where you don't have a lot of overlap, even if it's not quite consistent with reality. Contrast this with New York City, whose subway map is lit I have a heck of a time with it all the time because it's a literally an overlay on the city, and so you get lines crossing and all too close together. It's harder to read. The relevance here, then, is if we take a look at this particular demonstration, you'll get a sense of just how distorted those London underground maps actually are. So I'm going into the SVG uh, directory of tonight's examples directory. Uh, this is called undergroundmorph.svgz, which just means it's a compressed version of the stuff we'll talk about tonight. But what's neat about this is that you'll actually see in embedded in the SVG is some morphing, some animation, which you can do as well. So this is pretty much what you see in simple form on, an X on a tube map in London or on the maps we provided you. When you actually output it as SVG using the geographic coordinates, you'll see something more like this. So realize if your thing looks like this, which is not at all like this, that's to be expected. So this is just to give you a sense of the actual distortion that's happening. It's okay. It should look that way. So this is just a neat little SVG demonstration. Yours does not need to be animated or have these bells and whistles, but it's a nice little way of visualizing the true distortion. And it's a lot easier to read this version than, say, the truest version. Um, this is sort of Xtube, uh, this, is X, this is an amazing implementation of Xtube, but was done with Adobe Illustrator, not with SVG. Um, if we, Gtube map, this too is a compressed version, so if we go into Gtube map SVG, and this isn't even like the answer key, don't get excited that, ooh, we have the SVG file, which SVG also supports a view source feature, well, I don't think you'll find the output of Adobe Illustrator 
to be at all useful anyway. But the output is actually quite beautiful. It's small on the screen here, but what's nice in that whoever did this up by hand, they actually put the labels of the station in a convenient location. What you'll find is that it is non-trivial, if not impossible, to dynamically output the labels for your station in the SVG part of Project 2 in such a way that they don't overlap other labels. It's really going to be hard and it's by no means necessary to get output as pretty as this. But what you can see here not only is a nice hand job on this output, but you can also see the actual geographic layout of the, of the tube system because this is in fact the geographically true version, not the distorted, useful, user-friendly version. What you can do with Adobe's SVG Viewer, incidentally, is you don't have to stare at it like this. If you hold, for instance, the control key, you get a little plus sign, as you do in most programs, and you can start to zoom in, and it looks quite sharp. In fact, you can continue zooming to quite an extent, and just notice how sharp not only the text looks, but also the lines, and that's because of this inherent vector-based definition for the language. And then to zoom out, we can similarly do that. So, the point here is twofold. One, you can do some neat things with scalable vector graphics. Two, this is roughly what your tube implementation will look like. But realize, too, you're taking on the challenge of not only the tubes, but also the trains and trams. But frankly, just because you have more data doesn't mean the problem gets any harder, because after all, the structure is entirely the same for those as well. Um, Russia, just to round things out and take a look at different continents, this too is an example of something actually done in SVG of Moscow's metro system. This one here is called Moscow.svg. This one is messier, particularly with its labels, but perhaps more reminiscent of the quality output that you would get at a first pass of XSLT generated SVG. We can similarly zoom in here. And you'll see the labels in this case quite ugly, but again, this was SVG and it was outputted using not only circles, which we'll find to be quite easy, and straight lines and so forth, but also with essentially rectangles for text-based labels. So again, just an example of the sort of stuff you can do. Um, the colors here, too, are uh, reminiscent of what you'll be using in S2, X2. So let's take a look at some of the constructs here for SVG. We'll spend probably slightly more time on SVG than XSLFO. This language I think you'll find fairly intuitive and very easily self-taught based on these examples. And what you'll see in these examples, frankly, is even more than you'll need to satisfy the challenges of Xtube. So realize that you get a bit more of a taste of what more you can do with it than you actually need. And this, too, remains the sort of thing where Committing to memory the various attributes and elements for the language on first pass, not so useful, right? Keeping the lecture notes to your side or an online tutorial by your side is more than sufficient to recall exactly what you can do. But it's all rather intuitive. First and foremost, here's an example of how we might generate, quite uninterestingly, some text with SVG. We've got our XML declaration up top. We've got our DTD up top, which is a copy-based job from here on out, right? This is the DTD. That is the... Um, specification for the SVG 1.1 language, so that has already been provided for you in the template for Xtube, for instance. The SVG root element is called SVG. Oddly enough, we seem to have it redundantly here, SVG colon SVG. What's the role of these dueling SVG instances? Right, so in this case we have simply uh, explicitly associated SVG with the SVG namespace, which is on the second line of our XML fragment here, and that too would be the namespace identifier for SVG. So, so this is as though we had said XSL colon style sheet, XSL colon template, same constructs as we've seen before. Um, height and width really give us a, in Photoshop speak, like a canvas on which to work that you may or may not want to include. Here we have a 5 inch high and 5.5 inch wide um, uh, canvas, if you will. SVG text is the sole child here, and as you might imagine, this is simply going to output a rectangle of text that says, quote unquote, this is SVG. It's going to be filled in with red, and its Y offset is going to be 15 pixels. So the 0, 0 coordinate for an SVG image, like almost every file format for images, you get uh, your canvas is a rectangle. Top left-hand corner is 0, 0. So 15 is going to be 15 points downward, 15 pixels downward. We can take a look 
at this example among the online examples here. This was text.svg. I say it's uninteresting because it's quite uninteresting. Um, it's ever so slightly offset by 15 pixels in this case. Um, but you, can, you can't really see it on the overhead all too well, but there is actually a white box around that text in slight contrast to Internet Explorer's gray background, which you can't really make out here. But the dimensions are, in fact, true. So I offer that just as a, a ramping up to some stuff more interesting, which are, of course, shapes. The only difference with this particular example, again, teaching this by example, is that almost everything else is the same, except I've changed the middle child, the child element of the root to be SVG rect for rectangle. I've specified a style of fill blue. You'll notice that SVG really borrows heavily from CSS. So a lot of the, at, the properties that you see in CSS as you teach yourself or pick up new skills, just assume if it's in CSS, it's in SVG. That's not an unreasonable place to start. The width of this rectangle is going to be 250. The height's going to be 100. You can rather imagine what this thing is going to look like, rec.svg. Voila. Looks rather like a rectangle. If we proceed, and actually, that is misleading for the reason that my canvas is smaller than the rectangle. If our dimensions are to be 250 by 100, that's a bit off. So what I'm actually going to do is, on the fly here, go into tonight's examples directory, which is in lecture 6, open up rec dot in the SVG directory rec.svg, and just for now, I'm just going to kill the height and width canvas issues. Makes the example even simpler. Refresh, and now the canvas is just assumed to be the whole document. Now we can see the right proportion. So I'll go through later and clean up the canvas just to get rid of it so that we can actually see the correct dimensions here. Okay? Pretty straightforward if your goal is to output a rectangle. Probably not an interesting application for a rectangle, but what if we wanted to do things more interesting? Xtube probably is going to involve generating some circles or some kinds of circles to demarc the stations or squares, whatever, some lines perhaps. So let's just take a glance at some of the basic shapes. But I say they're uninteresting because they're all rather intuitive and straightforward. How do you do a circle? Well, you use the SVG circle element. Here, to keep things clean, I haven't even used the SVG prefix, so assume that the default namespace in this case is the URI that's used for SVG. Okay, keeps the slide a little cleaner. CX and CY, take a hazard a guess at what those are referring to. The center, XY coordinates of this thing um, are, the radius is going to be 20 pixels and it's going to be red. Hence, you get that thing at the top right, that circle. If you want an ellipse, sort of an elongated circle, CX, CY, same idea. It's the center of the ellipse. RX is the radius in a horizontal sense. So RY is a radius in a vertical sense from the midpoint of the, or from the center, rather, of the ellipse. It, too, is going to be red. You get a picture like that. A line, there are a couple ways to do these, one of which is to specify an X1, Y1 and an X2, Y2, which is a start point and an end point, you get a line between them in whatever stroke color is actually specified there. So you get the line up top there. Notice then that the first point in terms of 5, 5 is which end of that line, top left or bottom right? It's the top left, because the top, very top left corner is 0, 0. And so when you get more positive, you go down, and more positive along the X, you go to the right not negative when you go down, positive. Keep that in mind. That alone, that mental flip can be a nuisance for those unfamiliar with typical graphics. Polygon. So polygon lets you do things that are somewhat more flexible, a little more arbitrary. You have points. And this is where, frankly, I think XML starts to get a little sloppy. There are other instances of this space-separated approach to values in an XML attribute, which I just have always, it's always struck me as somewhat hackish, but it's hard to imagine a better way when the alternative would be to have God knows how many other attributes or children nested beneath it to achieve the same effect. So this is less verbose at least. The points here specify that one point of the polygon should be 5-5, five, five, the next should be 45-45. Forty-five. Forty-five. So which of those lines has just been drawn? Top left to bottom right. From there we go to 5-45, which is going to be right over to the left, and then it continues. Notice that we've only specified four points, yet we seem to have a closing 
mark, it's closed automatically being a polygon in this case, right? Polygons are closed shapes. Polyline, by contrast, is not a closed shape, so the same set of points keeps things open at top. Rectangle we've already seen, um, and in this case we have, I define somewhat differently though, I think, where we have an XY point uh, for the top left corner, and then we have in RX, RY, which is the the, yeah, the radius in a weird rectangular sense, but you get the same kind of output. Um, in this case, I'm not sure offhand if that is the center in this case or if it is the top left coordinate. So, in uh, question, yeah. Oh yes, wait, yes. It is, it is. I'm forgetting our own example here. Yes, thank you. Good catch, good catch. Right, so the short of it is the height and width defines actually how boxy this thing is. The Rx and Ry essentially tells you that mathematically if you were to stick something here to create a circle, what the radius, I believe, of that circle would be that's chopping off the corner of that rectangle. I'd have to look more closely at the definition, but I think that's the idea of how you s cut off the corner. Yeah. Yeah. It is, but I believe, it's a good question. Um, I'd have to try it, actually, in context. If, well, let's do it right now. We can paste this in quite easily. Sorry? Oh, you want to take a vote? All right. Who thinks if we change fill to red it, or blue, it will fill something in? Fill the triangle, all right. So let's take a look. I don't often have occasion to use polylines, so let's change this rect example temporarily to be this. Let's just recreate it as it was, just so we can see it. I'm sorry? Oh, and we can do this to be consistent with our code. So this is the original, and it does appear as my excerpt suggests. So now we're going to change fill to, let's say, blue, just to get some contrast. And of those of you who voted uh, just on hunches alone, So it sounds like, without looking at the spec, it fills it in as though it were the resulting polygon. So use at will. Let me roll this back to the original. All right. I don't think you'll find much occasion for polylines, at least with Xtube. So we shall see. Um, paths. These, become, these start to get a little more interesting because we're now seeing manifestations of um, shapes and curves and so forth that are dependent on say geographic coordinates or starting points certainly or geographic coordinates between two different points. I mean that in a sense is a line. You probably have for two different stations on your map not the length of the line between them but rather the XY coordinates of one and the XY coordinates of another. So in effect what you want is a path that happens to be a line. Um, there are many more ways to do paths than you need to deploy. You, they are simply rather flexible. In this particular example you see one instance with a little excerpt from the spec that describes exactly what the various and again hackish sort of use of XML attributes but such is the way it is. Almost everything's a copy paste from before only that middle line really has changed where we say XVG path. We have then several different specifications here. So we have an attribute of D with a value of M space 50, 10, L, 351, L, 200, 120, Z. What the heck is this all about? Well, this pretty much is the canonical definition of all of these various sort of weirdly laid out elements. We have an M command, which is a move to. Maybe this is bringing back memories of like logo from 20 years ago. But we have M, which says move to that coordinate, 50, comma 10, essentially. Um, move line to. So the next thing you want to do is draw a straight line to the following pair of XY points. We have another line there, and then a Z, and then Z is close path, which means close the current path by drawing a line to the last move to. So that's like the effect of the polygon built-in shape. 
So you can imagine this being much simpler if you just have two points to connect, for instance. I'm just wondering, yep. the first airline was in Windjammer. Okay. A curve two. So, and again, I chose intentionally sort of the simpler examples here. So, you, there are a couple of other options which I tried to move past there. L, which we've seen as a straight line. C, which is a curve two using essentially a certain mathematical approach that would draw a curved line effectively between two points using a, uh, an assumed formula. An A or an arc, which achieves a similar effect but a different approach. Um, and those are the two that we've omitted. So, essentially, if you used a C, or an A between two points, you wouldn't get a straight line between them, you would get a curve or really an arc defined according to the parameterization. Yes, because you need the parameterization on how, I forget the, the right term for it, but exactly how I think deep the curve is going to be, whether it's going to be one of these or whether it's going to be one of these. I would have to check. I, I used this when we did some of our own plotting, but it's been a while. So. Somewhat simpler, perhaps, might be this example, which is more clear in its use of commas and so forth. Here we have a move to 545, do a curve to uh, C55, and then the other two points are similarly implied. So actually, here we go. Let's actually pull this one up, which we have as path2.svg. And these are all in among your printouts from tonight, if you'd like to follow along that way. Here is a simple example that makes use of this same code where we start at 545. So 5 only puts you 5 pixels in, but 45 pixels down, which is why the bottom left of that ellipse, or hyperbola, is at the bottom left, essentially. The other two points, x, y coordinates, you have C5, uh, C, 5, 5, which is the top left. 45.5, which is the top right, and 45.45, which is the bottom right. So in effect, what you're defining here by using the C, uh, the C uh, operation is a box that the curve, according to the predetermined mathematical formula, will sort of asymptote to, but never actually touch any of the edges. So in short, meant to give you a visual of it, it's a sort of like creating a rectangle and saying don't draw this rectangle, but draw a pretty tight curve within it. And you can further parameterize it, but um, I'll defer, say, to a more exhaustive online reference for the details. Um, anchors. So you can similarly embed things like links. So this too, the only thing we've really changed is this middle line here. Notice I'm using text, which began these series of examples. But what I am doing above that is using what's called an anchor tag in SVG. And I'm using this attribute I alluded to earlier called href in the xlink namespace, which we'll revisit in a few lectures' times. But in effect, what this allows you to do, even within SVG, this is the anchor example, is to have a bunch of text, but as might be useful in, for instance, Xtube, you can click on that element, whether it's a piece of text or a circle or something else, and you can actually link to different documents. So Xtube doesn't really require that you do any kind of hyper-referencing or so forth, but you can begin to imagine some interesting application where maybe you could click a little window and pop up a little pop-up description with additional information on the station. You could, of course, do this in HTML itself using like an a image map or some kind of JavaScript control to figure out where you're clicking, but SVG allows you to do it as well. But we'll come back to Xlink in the future. For now, it's so similar to an HTML anchor that it is perhaps self-explanatory. Definitions. This might be useful in Xtube. If you are using your own pretty defined circles a lot, to demark a station, and it's not just a circle, but maybe you spent some time and did a little open circle or a black dot with a special circle on it to demark a, next tu a tube stop versus a tram stop or whatever, reusability of code can be useful. So you can define what are called definitions, whereby you provide a deaths element pretty much at the top of your document or thereabouts, and you specify that you want to use um, in this defs block, you have a definition for something called rect, which is coincidentally named. It could be called 
foo or bar, whatever the value of the ID attribute is, and hereafter, anytime you refer to something called rect with a, slat, uh, with a um, sharp symbol, well, that is going to essentially refer to an instance of a rectangle object of width 15, height 15 filled with red. So the effect you have down below elsewhere in your SVG document is the ability to use a reference and simply include another instance of that thing. But you can specify the XY start location for the top right, top left corner of that thing. So it lends itself to reusability of code. You might find it useful for Xtube, you might not, because after all, you're generating your SVG with XSLT, so inherent in your templates is probably already the ability to reuse code, but consider now the ability of generating the utility of these things and generating smaller code, right? You could just use XSLT to generate this rectangle a lot of times, but you're going to get a copy-paste, copy-paste, copy-paste of the same thing, which in the aggregate might contribute to a larger file size. Using things like use and defs allows you to refer back to a previous definition and potentially use fewer bytes, keeping your file size down, which for large documents can be a useful thing. So realize that it exists and it's not hard to deploy. This now is a little implementation of Xtube that I whipped up only for the circle line, but it's meant to, one, just give you a more concrete sense of what we mean by depict Xtube with SVG. This, for instance, is the circle line with all of the stops depicted with the station names. I've even given you the source in what's called circle.svg, and you'll see that in circle.svg, it's very small by default because we left the canvas very big, but again, you can just zoom in on it if you want to see it in the clo uh, up close, or you can view source, and you'll notice in the source, though it's a little small here, I paste it into stylus for discussion, notice that we're using this uh, element called G a lot. Think of G, and this too should be fairly readable just from the code itself because it's just all repetitive. So if you understand six lines, you understand 60 lines, frankly. G is like uh, a block or the equivalent of div or P in HTML, creating a sort of grouping that can have some uh, attributes associated with it, um, a set of properties like a certain font or a certain width associated with it. But notice in short that we're using, I'm using a different instance of the line element Rather than doing this crazy path approach, I'm actually specifying an x1, y1 starting point, an x2, y2 ending point, and that really is all you need to get by with Xtube and connect two stations with a line. Notice how I'm using stroke here and the hex color value to capture the color of that line. And realize that I think I may have changed the definition of yellow in Xtube. XML this year, so the hex value might be somewhat different from this particular example when I last turned this thing out. But the idea is the same. Here is how you connect two points with a line of a certain color and a certain width. So I offer it as a suggestion. Why is this file so long? Well, whoops. Well, there's a whole lot of lines connecting it. So the rest of those elements are somewhat uninteresting. But if we scroll down sufficiently, notice that later we have another group. And again, the G element is fairly straightforward, again, in that it's like the div or the P tag, which means everything nested inside of this would share some aesthetic properties, namely in this case, a black stroke, a width of 0.2, a fill of white, and then I specify an ID, which actually I don't think I actually make use of, but it's sort of a useful thing for me to keep track of the fact that this collectively, this group, are all of the stations. So I gave it an ID, if only for implicit commenting. But here's how I did my circles. We'll use this one since I can point at it. So I used the circle element, which we saw earlier. CX, CY, we saw earlier. R, we saw earlier. Not so hard. And I gave it a title as well, which you can do, which isn't the actual label, but it's the title, which I think has the effect of some hover over sort of thing. If you hover over, you can actually see like a, an alt tag, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But later, in the document, sort of a three-part, three-group approach. Now I actually lay out all of the text. And here, too, you can be a little more intelligent than I was, but I pretty much took the XY coordinate of a station's point, added a few pixels here and there just to give it a little offset, and then I used a text element using my choice of font style and size and family, and then outputted, if we scroll to the right, the names of the stations. Yeah, 
Uh, could I have put the font elsewhere? Yeah, in fact, this is a little excessive in that I've uh, reused so much, but sure, I could factor out some more of the commonality and put it in the grouping, sure. So I offer that really this lowers the bar to actually getting started with this because you can imagine now the trickery is one, just making maybe some aesthetic decisions of your own if you think I did kind of an ugly job here and you're certainly welcome to do something much better. But this is also to say it doesn't take much to generate something like this. And I would welcome for let's say brownie points or possibly brownies someone to consider how you might intelligently with XSLT and or SVG do something more intelligent with the labels However, take comfort in the fact that output like this is 100% acceptable. It does not need to look like the Illustrator version that we saw earlier where a human intervened and moved things around. I forget offhand, but I am fairly certain I scaled them because the coordinates we give you are rather large. And I probably figured out dynamically with XSLT the maximum value so that I would know what kind of divisor to use. But I don't recall offhand, which is just as well because it means I leave it to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can, because we're using a browser plugin, it, it's almost of no consequence, which is why I think when I go back tonight and tomorrow, I'll just rip out the canvases from the example so that it just uses the whole screen and we don't get this, uh, we don't have a smaller canvas than we have imagery. Um, in short, it doesn't matter in this environment, but you can use, um, you could certainly group things in a screen using different um, canvases, if you will, by specifying those dimensions. Uh, usually, these points that we're referring to, I believe, are always done in pixels. The canvas size, though, can be specified in pixels or perhaps points or inches as well. In fact, the original I, spec I had was in inches. Yeah? Can the canvas be treated like it is in Windows or Macintosh graphics? Do you have a much larger canvas than your screen size and you just scroll? Yes, absolutely. Your a canvas can effectively be larger than your screen. And in a sense, that's what's been happening here when this was over here a moment ago. I was holding on a PC the Alt key, which changes my cursor to that hand and allows me to drag things over. But realize these kinds of functionality, like being able to zoom in and being able to move things around, this is a function of the SVG plugin, not of SVG itself. And you'll see in the uh, X, in the Project 2 specification, I offer usage instructions for how you can convert something like your SVG to a PDF or to a GIF or a JPEG because it is arguably a nuisance again for someone to have to install a plugin to do this but with a plugin they get more interactivity than you would with just a static JPEG or GIF. Okay, other questions? Okay, so XSLFO in a nutshell and again I promise not to spend much time on this only because I think you'll find with the several examples we provide more than enough to, for instance, generate the PDF for uh, Project 2, which again, stop asking why you're getting errors on running FOP when you don't actually have XSLFO, but now if you don't after tonight's lecture, now there's probably something wrong since you can't have XSLFO. The extent to which you need to use FO for Project 2, incredibly minimal. Uh, the only exercise there was just to get you used to some of the syntax and to the usage of FOP, particularly at the command line. In projects three and four, we'll make use of FOP in a server-side context where you use its Java-based API to generate a PDF on the fly. And I've included among tonight's examples an example of a purchase order that you could generate using FOP that has a nice table layout that includes images and really does look nice and suggests far greater capabilities than those we'll see tonight. And that's because in project four, you'll actually be generating receipts, quote unquote, for your e-commerce site once a user has actually checked out and purchased some number of goods. So XSLFO, as it's come to be called, is officially known as XSL 1.0. Back in the day, XSL and XSLT were part of the same recommendation and it was getting huge. So XSLT was yanked out, called XSLT, and what remained was left as XSL 1. To distinguish it more clearly, XSLFO is its nickname FO denoting 
formatting objects. And it's all about aesthetic markup. And it made sense really to tease the two apart because as you've seen, XSLT really is about the T, transforming XML, whereas FO is really, as you'll see briefly tonight, about formatting data or formatting, in, in generally speaking, uh, formatting objects. How can you render XSL FO? The nice thing is that with something like XSL FO, you can go to so many other formats. You can, using the appropriate processor, output SVG, RTF, PostScript, PDF, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So in that sense, it's sort of a neutral development language for aesthetic display. Here is the representative example from which we will work. And again, we'll revisit XSLFO in the context of future projects. So again, for the purposes of project two, where you're required to write X questions.xsl to generate XSLFO, it really is sufficient to do, to copy and paste really what we're providing here as a template, and then you'd probably have multiple blocks, one block for each question. And that should make slightly more sense when you actually see this run. But in short, and again, I'm comfortable going somewhat quickly here because these slides, more so than previous slides, really define piecemeal each of the various elements in the document. You have four main concepts for our purposes in FO. You have what's called a master, you have a flow, a block, and inline. The last two concepts are fairly simple in that they're familiar. Inline is sort of the equivalent in HTML of a span element. Uh, block is sort of the equivalent of a div or a P element. So conceptually, that's where they'll be used in XSLFO. So really, the only new ideas are master and flow. Essentially, master just boils down to how things are to be paginated and laid out. It's sort of the properties you might, in a WYSIWYG, get to under file page setup. That sort of stuff. Flow is the actual content. So it's the actual pages of text that you see before you. So it's like the body element in an HTML page. It's not quite a great analogy, but at least it's close enough to get us started. So the top of an XSL FO file, you might have a XML declaration, as we've seen before. And all of this now, this is the same representative example that we saw a moment ago on slide 27, but I'm only highlighting certain elements from it. So the first root element is this root element. It's in the FO namespace, or really the namespace uh, specified by the FO prefix, but the namespace is really defined by that URI. So we haven't really done anything interesting yet, but this is the root of all things FO. Layout master set is the child of this root, and this essentially is going to be a wrapper around all the pagination and layout information that, again, is sort of equivalent in spirit to a page setup option in, say, Microsoft Word. And notice, there's no attributes, so it isn't even that interesting yet, complicated as the various hyphenated words here might suggest. Now we get a little something interesting. Uh, the only child of that is what's called a simple page master, which think of this as the simplest template from which you might start writing a Microsoft Word document. It's sort of the basic. It's the, the normal style thinking in Microsoft Word speak. And it's where you would specify the geometry of the page and the various regions you might have, a header, a footer, a body, again, in the sort of Microsoft Word or even open office sense. Inside of that, we have the only thing of real specific interest. We've specified that the body region of the document that we'll ultimately see the output of is going to have a margin of one inch around the sides. That is the extent to which I've specified pagination and layout information for this document. I've used a simple page master, which again is like a built-in default generic layout, but I've more precisely specified give me one inch margins. That's it. But notice in the previous slide, 32, I did give this master a name. I defined this layout to be my first, and that's arbitrary. We just called it my first layout. Below that, and as the second child of the root, this is where we actually have our flow, essentially, our page sequence of flows. This is to say, I'm saying, at this point in the file, use the pagination information that I nicknamed my first and begin to include my actual content herein. And again, the attributes and the elements here look kind of scary, I think, in so far as they're rather wordy. But again, all we have here is a very basic template that, for now, a copy-paste job does suffice. Um, and here's our flow, the flow being really the location of our actual content. The flow here 
as a name of XSL region body. And essentially that is, again, in Microsoft Word speak, the body of the page. It's the stuff that's not the header and not the footer. It's where you would actually type your essay or your resume or so forth. And we gave it that predefined name of XSL region body. We call it a flow. And here it is. After all of this metadata, all of this setup, we get the actual content of this file, which is a single block of text, a paragraph tag, to borrow from HTML speak, saying hello world. If I now go on to NICE in our examples directory, you'll see in the XSL directory from tonight, hello.fo, which is precisely what we just looked at a moment ago. FOP, formatting objects processor, is the Apache implementation of some of the XSL FO spec. You will find, and I used limited examples, that FOP does not implement a lot of the spec. A lot of processors do not implement a lot of the spec, so you might occasionally get errors like, I don't know what it means to be italics. It's okay. You just kind of have to accept that for now. But FOP is as simple as typing as we say in the spec. For instance, FOP-FO, the FOP name, or rather the FO name, and then the format you want to output it as. And we choose, in most instances, PDF. And so I'm going to say hello.pdf. FOP does its thing. It's pretty quick. Notice it mentions a tree, so clearly there's some kind of XML processing going on there. If I just tab over to the results, which I logged into earlier, and go to um, what did I save it as? Hello.pdf. Oh, I'm logged into the wrong directory, aren't I? Oh, was it? Oh, there we go. If I download hello.pdf, pull it up in here, you're about to be underwhelmed. <laughs> hello world. But, and I'll leave this as um, teaching through example, because again, we'll come back to this for project three. Project one really suffices to go with an approach like this and just use multiple FO block elements. What you do see among our other examples tonight are we have a whole XML file, jabberwocky.xml, and I can come back to the, actually, let me do this one quite quick. Jabberwocky.xml has the markup for Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky poem. Okay, this is sim formatted probably similarly to how you might format questions.xml in your arbitrarily defined markup. In jabberwocky.xsl, notice that we have pretty much the same template we looked at, but I have a couple of templates now that generate the multiple XSL FO blocks. So this perhaps is your best starting point for writing your own questions.xsl. And again, I, I regret not having more time for this, but I do think you'll find that there's so little code. Most of this code here is of XSL. It's not FO. So with that said, if we run this jabberwocky.xsl on, uh, and we do this with Zalin, input of jabberwocky.xml, and we run this on ja with jabberwocky.xsl, if I just hit enter, what I'm going to get is the XSL FO. So the project spec mentions to you how you can save this in a file, but I believe already I have in a file what the output looks like, and I let it pretty print. Notice that you're getting output like this, which has a bunch of blocks, inside of which are a bunch of blocks. So the point really of Project 2 is having you do questions.xsl and questions.xml is just to acquaint you with some of the limited syntax of XSL FO and to just have you familiarize yourself with the command line usage of FOP. It's not meant to be hard. By all means, ask any and all questions online, but the Jabberwocky example will be quite, I think, instructive. And what we'll do in the future for Project 3 is look at the more complicated version of the PO FO, which actually shows you tables, inclusions of images, which will be relevant for project three. So with that said, we will move, if you would like, over to 106 for Q&A for the project two. Otherwise, I will see you next week. <laughs>